yeah, so, yeah. Uh, uh, on behalf of civil sky i welcome alex paul menon sir yeah uh, to launch our session so we are having a discussion on the challenges of governance in red corridor so shall we start the session sir yeah yeah we can we can we can yeah thank you sir thank you so much uh, so uh, uh, so these are all aspirants you know all of them uh, that that's that's what we are looking at right? Uh, yes, sir. Uh, we have interview aspirants and and also we have aspirants who are preparing for twenty twenty one also. Acha. Uh, so okay, what I will do? I actually have a very old presentation with me, which I uh, presented in uh, the LBS NEA. Uh, so I will use uh, that presentation, uh, you know, uh, uh, to to basically uh, speak of the. Topic. Uh, so can you can you see my screen yes sir you can see your yeah. screen yeah there is a working in naxal areas in experience presentation a very old one uh 80 in 2013 all right so so as you all have already read uh you know during the course of your preparations what are the challenges that are common in the Naxal areas? Uh, basically, one is that there is a there is high poverty uh, because of uh, you know lack of government intervention for, for for years after years, and there's a lot of political marginalization. I mean, the people don't find representation using the normal channels. There is a huge political marginalization of certain communities, and uh, yeah, and uh, there is there is low education in these areas normally. And there is limited employment opportunities in these areas in general because of absence of industries or absence of any 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 for that matter any I mean any huge uh, uh, you know service sector anything in these places lack of employment opportunities. Then there is this burning issue of uh, jal jungle jameen rights over water, uh, forest, and uh, land. Um, and uh, then comes uh, the induced displacement because. Because of the huge development project, uh, mines, um, uh, factories undertaken in these areas, uh, uh, and uh, uh, and low wages in whatever in whatever piece of employment which they are able to find, and the lack of governance in these areas. Okay, uh, yeah. So, and the biggest handicaps for administration uh, for, for, for 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 particularly for leadership in these areas is that. There is lack of good human resource in these areas, and whomsoever is available isn't of great quality, and whomsoever is available even of that quality also lacks motivation, uh, and this lack of motivation is is because of is because of uh, threat perception, um, because of uh, because of the threat perception that is seen in these areas, people feel threatened that you know each of them are vulnerable to. Uh, uh, national attacks or, um, or, 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 or kidnappings or, or any kind of you know you know of violence that can happen in these areas and uh, so there is this perpetual to do or not to do kind of a situation you know if you take a decision to move forward you never know if you're going to hit get hit or not and there is perpetual to do or not to do dilemma that is there uh, in people's minds you know take up a road project to take up irrigation project to go to a village to conduct a meeting, everything has its purposeful to do or not to do a uh, dilemma uh, in these places. Lack of access to roads, uh, communications, as well as transport systems uh, is also a very important feature and handicap of these areas. And uh, uh, public in general do not trust administration because of the historic historical neglect. Uh, uh, you know that is that is that is that is continuously happened in these places. There is also lack of awareness, and because of because of these two factors, there are a lot of intermediaries who crop up between public and uh, the um, administration, uh, who claim to speak uh, or represent the interests of the marginalized, but who hem who are the, who themselves have actually their own interests in mind. So many times in very very uh, difficult terrain in areas, you only. Act Actually, mostly listen to intermediaries and and to their whims and fancies, and then take up steps, and not really listen to people, and then take up steps in these areas. And these areas are also neck deep in corruption because uh, historically, these areas being considered as the traditional 
Kalapani is of administration. Uh, I mean, you all know what is a Kalapani. Kalapani is the jail in Andaman. So there are always administrative Kalapanis where we actually throw people into, uh, you know, such 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 corners, um, uh, unnoticeable corners. Uh, uh, you know, and, and these places are uh, these places are dens for such people who think people are inefficient, people are corrupt, and they're all thrown into these places. They posted in these places, and. Uh, the uh, national movement has also ensured that there are frequent blockades and bans because of one or other reasons, because of killing of the cadder, because of their uh, uh, um, uh, martyr weeks and uh, their own celebrations. Frequently, there are blockades and bans for some other reason. And uh, uh, there is a lack of understanding of local aspirations itself by government. Uh, governments do not really understand what people want in these areas. Rather, they pick up all superficial kind of a projects on on the basis of some kind of understanding uh, that this is what people actually need but people's aspirations are, are entirely different actually and there is huge ad hocism in these areas so most of the times what happens there is no systematic 10-year program there is no uh, uh, clear-cut policy template which every administrator continuously follows it has always been um, uh, no specific policy for actual areas but rather left to the understanding of the local administration to take up anything is huge ad hoc I mean, people respond only when there's an incident in place. Uh, you know, um, otherwise, otherwise there is there is no there is no complete, continuous, uh, holistic strategy to tackle the uh, underdevelopment in these areas. And there is an absence of outcome-oriented planning and strategies in these areas uh, because most of the times we, we really do not know what will come out of the initiative. Like if you think that you want to create a um, uh, cold storage you really will not know uh, you know who would come and place their uh, uh, agricultural produce in the in the cold storage so no, the, the, the absolutely zero understanding of uh, how what an outcome would turn up in the places we, we just most of the times uh, it's happening on hunch uh, actually so let me just share about you the uh, the sukma experience uh, because this has been a template uh, for almost every new district uh, in chatisgarh and i and i believe this would be the story of every hardcore affected areas in every other natural affected district in this country. So, Sukma was a new district, carved out of the Eswal Dantewada. It happened to be the, the headquarters of uh, Naxals themselves, and it is a big hotbed of Naxalism. Absolutely zero infrastructure. It's a small 14,000 strong uh, town, uh, you know, which became the capital uh, of the headquarters of the uh, district. Uh, so, to tell you how we tackle these challenges the first important challenge was to basically find out the building uh, which can actually function as a collectorate so the building which you're seeing here was actually built in 40 days december 8 is when uh, new people were posted uh, new officers are posted in the district as uh, uh, officers on special duty and uh, uh, from december 8 to january 16 um, uh, we had around uh, uh, 16 plus 22 days around, around anywhere around 40, 48 days uh, max. Uh, 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 16 plus 20 days, 36, 36 days max. So 36, 38 days max as uh, um, as our time limited to inaugurate a new district in place. So first of all, identifying a building itself for the collectorate was a challenge. The building which you're looking at was a small uh, forest training center uh, with few rooms on the ground floor. The first floor was built in record time of around 20 days uh, using just uh, uh, you know, sheets on the top and not even a proper um, a proper ceiling, actually. So when we started this building, uh, uh, there was nothing. It was absolute jungle. There was no compound or nothing. So it was a challenge to basically put up a functional building itself as a collectorate. And of course, when there is no uh, collector office, of course, uh, uh, there was no collector's house also. So you had to occupy, um, uh, I mean, um, a forest or two room a guest house as your house and start you know whatever you could from that small place uh, so the first challenge was to put in a functional collectorate uh, so what we said we said when we start the collectorate we will not start it uh, like every other traditional collectorate because we see that uh, this is a new opportunity and we should see this opportunity seize the opportunity and put new systems in place uh, we actually trained every staff who were picked up uh, to to uh, basically start with a with a um, e office, uh, so we had a NIC solution from Palaka at Kerala picked up, and uh, we, we we actually trained our staff in using it. And within a span of thirty days, we could actually train the twenty 
uh, staff who were picked up for the collector from different departments actually so that was a challenge and i remember one of my uh, one of my peons uh, when we were training the staff there was one peon who was standing on the uh, i'm standing at the door and peeping into the training that was happening so i happened to walk by and i just saw him and i patted him on his back and i asked him what happened what are you what are you looking at so he said uh, he said no sir i'm just looking at the training that is happening i asked him what is your qualification he said i am a 12th educated guy and i asked him are you interested in learning computers he said yes sir i said well, why don't you go inside and take a seat and start learning also he was like surprised he said he said even if i learn what I, what can i do i'm just a peon i'm supposed to just you know uh, 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 bring water bring tea that that is my job i said no uh, from everybody you know that that's where um, uh, uh, it, it works in a very very maxian kind of a fashion in, in in these areas from everyone according to his designation to everyone according to his capability that's what works in these places you know you you can't really use people as per their respective designations you will have to find out talent from among everywhere and pull them and use them uh, for anything which you think can work uh, basically so i asked him you learn the computers and you will find the job as a clerk you know i will offer you uh, the role of a clerk in the collectorate if you actually learn it efficiently so this boy picked up learning computers and he was actually given the job of a clerk after a while uh, so then so this is a very interesting story of supa uh, when we started uh, we said out of sight is out of mind so we we will always remain in the sight of people uh, of sight of the uh, the headquarters the state headquarters and to do that the important thing was to actually have it connected uh, through internet uh, you know now after uh, uh, 11 years uh, 2012 uh, is when the district started uh, somewhere in january 16 2012 uh 12 uh today it might seem that you know taking internet to the district headquarters might not be a challenge i will tell you examples i will share anecdotal examples where there was a sick call to go in uh, bijapur in uh, chatisgarh and uh, when we joined there there was only two landline phones in the whole district uh, in the in the district collectorate and uh, one phone was with the collector and other phone used to be in a common hall for three or four of us who were additional collectors and uh, sub collectors and joint collectors and that phone was actually connected to the satellites and the mobile network was connected through wire uh, because the wires can be cut the cables can be cut by nexus any time and to have continuity in internet uh, and inter and not internet in continuity in at least phone calls uh, the, uh, uh, the the landline phones network used to be connected to the satellite and if the landline phones rings uh the rings for at least 3 days uh, in a week it was supposed to be a very very good week you know that was the kind of situation we all started with in these new districts so uh taking internet uh, to the collectorate was a big challenge and to actually put in a facility and uh, if you all know the uh, vc facility of nic normally uses cameras imported from i think uh, um uh, germany polycom uh, kind of cameras which they use and uh, if you order it it will take a year or so to 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 uh, install anything so we had to actually address this challenge in 30 days so what we did after we set up this uh, uh, this uh, this hall uh, for uh, as our meeting hall uh, we i actually deputed a person to hyderabad to buy second hand polycom cameras uh, from hyderabad uh, you know because i mean you are forced to think you know do a lateral think um, um, use your lateral thinking skills in the first meeting when i asked them ki how are we supposed to address the challenge of putting a vc facility in place people said sir it is impossible if you order a camera it will take one me a time for us then i asked him why is it that we need to put in a fresh camera why can't we have second hand cameras do we have second hand cameras available then somebody told me yes sir it's possible to get it in uh, delhi or in hyderabad then i gave somebody uh, you know i mean 3 to 4 lakh rupees uh, cash and then send him uh, to hyderabad to to just scourge for uh, a polycom uh, vc camera and get it and get it uh, back and uh, that is how we procured a camera to start and then we had to lay 4 kilometers of ofc cable and uh, we actually used different schemes uh, to dig and to lay the cables and we did the cabling work ourselves because bsnl exchange did not even have a proper uh, you know officer there uh, in that area so most of the work like even a you know, work which appears very small uh, in the normal districts is a huge challenge in those districts basically but you never give up what you do is that you clear an agenda and then you pick up all kind of processes to do it 
um and then then we put this in fact i will tell you the electricity connection to this building came uh, from a, from a neighboring building where we actually had to put in fresh transformers and everything in place and the funds for the transformers came from sarasabia because the neighboring building was a, was a school big size school building and we could, we could actually use sarasabia beyond to fund uh, transformers for that school building and there we also draw electricity to our collectorate so you know even basics very small things uh, it's it's a big fight and the challenge there but you don't give up you always find out like a rat you keep scavenging for schemes for funds from where you can actually bring in things to establish things without violating you know the law uh, is is what you do finally so that's how we started as vc and surprisingly out of the nine new districts supma was the only district to start a vc facility on day one the cm was pretty surprised asking me how did he even achieve that and uh, you know uh, my um, um, uh city leadership uh, they they asked me a copy of my note sheets and circulated my note sheets to every other collector eight new district collectors to tell them look this is how uh, you actually do the do the jugad uh, to get uh, uh, um, to get the vc facility in the new collectorate uh, you know do you uh, see what happened many times uh, when you uh, actually uh, i won't call it as breaking the law when you actually creatively interpret the law and uh, you do something then finally it becomes the law itself basically that's how things worked in supa uh and then uh, we started with the bank in the district to tell the world that this is a new district this this is important because engagement with the public and continuous engagement with them uh, um, uh, you know is a very very important thing in this place you can't just sit idle not meet them not people you will have to interact with them as much as possible but take part in the local festivals arrange uh, uh, events uh, bring people out like when we started the district we did a three day uh, jilla mahotsav uh, where uh, you know uh, in sukma standards uh, 25000 people assembled i will tell you the population of sukma when we started the district around 2.5 lakh population and around 45000 families in total so if there is a gathering in sukma with more than 20000 plus uh, audience it's a huge gathering uh, in sukma standards so when we started when we started at the bank telling the world that look we are a new district now we are going to chart a different path now chart a path of development people turned up and you know that engagement with people started from day one itself basically and we want to send a message that look here we are doing these things for for peace and justice and uh, the the theme itself was uh, uh, to bring the nexal violence affected children and uh, give them and give them the, the whole um um uh, the the event where we are supposed where we were supposed to inaugurate a district where the cm was supposed to come all the walls were painted white and given to the school children who were part of the pota kebins where nacional violence to children were uh, being educated uh, and to express themselves freely about violence uh, peace and justice in these walls uh, and uh, you know we 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 clicked we clicked with the uh, public uh, itself actually you know and we involved women also um and we gave them a the theme of women education and you know and things move and uh, one of the most important reasons as to why there is huge distrust uh, um, um, on administration itself is that um food security uh, is, is is a big challenge in these areas one is there are a lot of uh, difficult to reach uh, pda shops and during range they are cut off for four five months and, and people walk uh, 9 to 20 kilometers uh, Uh, to reach these places and uh, this is an incident i would not want to speak about it much but i wanted to just tell you that food security is a very essential element and we need to ensure that every ration card holder gets his due collected from the station and he is not walking uh, or moving a long distance to get his ration so i had to open up nine new pda shops not new pda shops shops which have been shut down because of insistence of the police forces that uh you know these are nacional affected areas and whatever shops are op- being opened here are opened and they uh, are used by nacionals to collect rations so like we had to fight against this you know this this whole uh, policing uh, uh, perception that we should starve people uh, in these areas that no see look we can't starve people we have to provide them rations and uh, you can't starve all of the people in the name of a few nacionals so you know it is a it is a it is a tight fight with the with the policing uh, a perception and uh, changing the perception and then taking rations to every ration shop opening up all those old shut down shops and you know and uh, taking quality rations to uh, uh, these things this this is a very interesting story uh, uh, because it says you know it's it, it's about purchasing from barmart directly so there used to be a camp called jagargonda where nacional violence affected villages 
were marooned in an island kind of a uh, you know um, uh, island kind of a uh, setup uh, and we used to reach only via helicopters the road to jagargonda was cut off jagargonda was such as a prosperous town long back because of nationalism and being cut off from mainstream the roads are all damaged no buses used to go very long back 30 40 years back the later on it all stopped and this place jagargonda was a maroon island with the, with the forces maintaining around 3000 families there so once in 6 months we used to carry rations all the way to jagargonda and there used to be a ration mafia uh, which used to operate which used to actually sell everything in double the prices uh, to to in the in the tender they used to form a ring and uh, so when they formed the ring we really, so like like the dal at that time was 60 rupees in the local market but they were selling those at 120 rupees so we had to break the a grip of the ration mafia so i made a committee locally uh, under the chairmanship of the uh, sub collector and asked him to explore prices in the outside market and because we knew walmart's pricing were open we decided to actually uh, you know skirt the existing procurement processes and procure directly from walmart and there was a saving of around 13 lakh rupees of, uh, in these things and the first time in i don't know how many years 2006 and 7 around 7 8 years that good ration dal and um, uh, uh, everything isa products were taken to jagargonda we it takes us 3 days to take rations and reach that jagargonda uh, camp you know we have to open up a road opening party and uh, all the vehicles move in a convoy we remove landmines on the way and uh, you know and when people saw that great quality rations came their way for the first time after 6 7 years they were so elated it was a huge shift in public opinion and trust towards administration so many times what happens is that you have to take a decision in public interest and that decision may not be in accordance with the existing rules and regulations and you we will justify what your stance is in your files and do what is right rather than you know doing doing what does the book says and uh, this is something uh, another initiative i want to speak about because in these areas many times what happens is that you don't move on standard solutioning what you do is you know, this area is like jagargonda as i spoke about the best way to make the naxals open up the roads there was to put up a bus to jagargonda you know this this looks like totally out of the box totally uh, you know not going by the road where we said you know, the people said there are no roads i said how does it matter still there are at least some four wheelers moving right so what we will do we will make the public general public mend the roads we will tell we are going to send a bus to jagargonda at least a stop till before jagargonda we will move a bus first a small bus and then uh, people there should be demand for the bus and once there is demand for the bus people's people's voices will turn against the naxals and they will say that no, look we want a road you can't keep cutting off the roads you know because you want our people to move to get access to access to hospitals access to education so you know, we decided to experiment with this thing and this whole bus costed us i don't know how much i don't, I don't remember now we use certain funds from the revolving funds from the jfmcs to give a loan to the jfmc society to send these two buses in those difficult areas bus and a jeep basically as public transport uh you know people people were laughing and they saying that there are no roads why is this guy why is the collector putting up a bus there but the whole idea is basically the moment you put in a bus you show sincerity that you know we are serious about uh, taking a public transport to till the last mile there in the district whereas it is only the naxals who are actually not letting it happen so public opinion turns against them so this bus may or may not work but what you actually do is you continue continuously tackle public opinion and change it in the favor of a, a good and a just administration and that's what happened in this uh, bus services uh, thing today there are roads in jagargonda you know uh, and i i really don't know how much these bus services which started uh, helped in changing public opinion towards um, uh, building these roads and you know and also making naxals go on a um, um, uh, go on a back, uh, um, uh, go on a back foot uh, yeah again livelihood is a very important aspect so we immediately focused on putting in livelihood college there picked up a whole polytechnic building and because the whole polytechnic had only one staff posted the rest of them had not been even recruited and he was a peon there was nobody else in the polytechnic college the building was built so we took it over and we put in a livelihood college in place we brought in uh, the um uh, i uh, ilfs uh, a skilling agency all the way to sukma by by a lot of after a lot of persuasion a lot of carrot and stick and then we started one trade uh, because 
all of the all of the uh, uh, young boys and girls who are going to come to you are all potential cadres the moment you don't recruit you don't recruit them into something they are going to be good for some other purpose so somewhere this engagement with people about 14 years of age till 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 certain age where you target them give them something to hold on to is so important i will show you photographs so we gave them assured placement training folded out of the start with this is a industrial sewing machine training uh, so uh, um, you know look at this photograph carefully there are set of women who are there who were trained this industrial sewing machine training and after two years uh, 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 not after two years after a year after a year i was there in raipur uh, um uh, railway station with my family because i they had to go to train and i was there there was one girl who walked in from a small crowd of people and asked me sir your men and sir right i said yeah yeah i am alex so she said sir uh, sir i am so and so and i come from this village uh, of uh, sukma i was very glad and asked her which acha how did you come here to raipur and she told me sir uh, uh, i was trained in the livelihood college and i am actually going to bangalore and i am offered i mean this is 2012 i am offered uh, 12000 rupees as salary and i now stay in a paid accommodation in bangalore and i am so happy that i could escape sukma uh, so i i was so glad and elated and uh, you know i patted her and i said that's very good you have to motivate more people to do this i left later on i came to understand that girl was actually a case study because she had faked tb uh, tuberculosis when the naxals came to recruit her she had continuously coughed and coughed and coughed faking tb and they are so terrified of tb because they think that uh, you know if people uh, one, one one has got tb it will spread to everybody else it's so contagious so they don't normally recruit people who have tb so this girl escaped from becoming a naxal cadre by faking tb came to a livelihood college learned a trade and went all the way to bangalore uh, you know to get employed as a very very heart rending story for me because you know this is these little opportunities matter every small opportunity to create for the people to escape uh, to escape this whole cycle of violence matters basically uh, and uh, you know these are all our destroyed school buildings which the naxals had destroyed had destroyed in um, in sukma because uh, uh, forces uh, forces used these buildings uh, for staying and there was a supreme court uh, uh, regulation saying that the uh, forces should not use school buildings these are the only four walled ceiling wala buildings in these villages anyway so when the forces were also moved out and the naxals uh, uh, destroyed this building by placing ieds inside and you know by bombing them uh, by destroying them so we had to build alternative uh, port we called them as porta cabins or portable cabins bamboo based cabins were built all across bastar where all the naxal violence affected children were brought in from remote villages and we provide them stay um, um, stay and food and then you know start uh, educating them so when you see such calamity such calamity is also an opportunity because otherwise you don't find 400 people 400 people in a single place and when you get to see 400 people in a single place and you actually have funds to do that what to tend to do is to build model campuses so how this was turned up is that we we all of these uh, porta cabin ashrams which as uh, which we used to call them we reformed them into model campuses you know uh, uh, these were treated as model residential schools for excel well and for children uh, i mean the ambience the ambience being top class uh, with all the facilities for them um, uh, with summer camps and uh, uh, yoga classes karate classes music classes and what not uh, you know this is also a very interesting photograph i i i very fondly remember this photograph because uh, uh, these photographs were taken when i went there to visit visit the boys and girls when the summer camp was being conducted in the month of march um uh, i actually visited this campus and i and i i started playing with the boy young boys and girls uh, and um, i i purposely lost a match to them while playing with them and uh, Uh, you won't believe uh, when i was when i was kidnapped it was uh, it was a boy uh, who from a very remote village uh, gave out this message that i am safe and sound and uh, i was seen walking uh, while crossing a village 
and that was one boy who had actually played the carrom board with me otherwise you know nobody would have been known the face of a district collector you know by engaging with people and by engaging it uh, and by engaging on a very personal note and by you setting the trend or the pattern or the model for the rest of your administration to follow where you engage with people at a very very personal level you know it sets the tone for administration also and you know one of these one of these boys uh, was the one who actually gave the news out to the outside world that i am safe and sound uh yeah and we also you know try to put in a a radio in place a community radio in place uh called sukmata mata the voice of uh, sukma in gondi language here two lessons are very important from this uh, picture one is that taking up communication in the local language is very important if possible we need to actually pick up the local language and there is no iec in the local language that is actually uh, been uh, given to uh uh citizens of uh, in these remote areas the naxals have picked up gondi and halbi and they are producing literature in gondi and halbi whereas we have fallen short in picking up the local dialect the local tongue and creating content not new content but at least uh you know existing existing uh, um, um, uh, cultural content which the which the which the, which the uh, uh, local people already have their songs their stories um you know their festivities all of them can be can be recorded and uh, and you know and, and transmitted using community radios and as well as you know just telling people about the schemes uh, in gondi and halbi makes a big dent because many people don't even know that there are good schemes all over the government so you know this is one more step uh, so there are a lot much to speak about this thing uh, i mean uh, the the question is we need to ask ourselves that if we are the change agent uh, are you you know i mean are we ready to sail are we are we there for public are we there are we there are we going to stand there uh, uh, i mean against against every challenge every day that will come up but not give up and you know and keep and put up a brave fight uh, in these places so the strategies mostly uh, that has worked in this area is generally uh, i would now you know try to generalize from all of our personal experience there's from a lot of young collectors who worked in these places this is there's a you have to pay a lot of attention to education and literacy in these areas and dealing with the trust factor is the most important thing the first thing you have to deal with is trust because administration needs to be not only seen as uh, development oriented uh, it also be has to be seen as just because a just administration is what they fear you know the moment the moment they know that there is a person who would stand by justice public rally around you and and you know the moment and the moment they rally around you we are actually snatching the ground from below for the naxal so you now developing the trust factor on a very personal note of yourselves of your institution of your subordinates of your officers is something very very crucial uh, in these areas actually and then what you can normally do you cannot you know you cannot develop the whole area in a single shot in a year in three years or five years anyways so what you do is actually you create development triggers you put in models in place Like you can't transform all the schools in a single shot. So what you do, you choose ten schools and then you 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 showcase them as development model, development triggers. Then you what you do, you also prioritize. You don't tackle every department. You don't tackle every scheme. You know what would work in this is you only prioritize that. Then you pilotize. You prioritize and then you pilotize. You do one or two good pilots and from there you proliferate. You know that this these only these things work. You can't just en masse plan for huge all round development in this area. So what you do, you always prioritize. you pilotize and then you proliferate from your successes from your pilots and then uh, you need to prevent leakage of development funds uh, by ensuring quality by ensuring monitoring by ensuring spending itself most of the times funds do not get spent in these areas so by ensuring spending itself you know is a is a huge uh, prevention of leakage in these areas and most of the times uh, what happens is that if, i mean there are protests in these areas for for right things so you cannot you cannot just look at every protest as sponsored Uh, as as being part of the naxal uh, strategy itself you need to accommodate peaceful protests you need to listen to people you need to take uh, um, i mean take uh, take requests and recommendations from them and implement them and you know keep accommodating peaceful protests as much as possible so that that is where you actually you know uh, give vent to them and we also build trust in each of these peaceful protests when you actually address the cause when people know that you listen to peaceful protests in the the uh, the tenet of violence slowly disappears uh, from the place basically you know and many times what happens is like there are a lot of cliched uh, prejudices uh, that 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 get passed to you as feedbacks like 
no, the Kamars don't come to work in NRGS. You know, the, the tribals behave this way. The tribal uh, the tribals have no... There are a lot of prejudices against the uh, tribals, basically. Don't believe anything. Don't believe anything when we actually have to work in these places. You just have to know things yourself. You have as much as public interaction as possible yourself. And whenever there is a prejudice passed to you, please go down and check it yourself. You know, that's how it works. Um, uh, like I have a lot of experiences and when I've I seen that, uh, like any such comments passing that, you no know, tribals do not like to work under NRDGS, you know, it doesn't work that way. The tribals are lazy. No, they are not lazy. They're one of the most hardworking people. The tribal women don't come to work. No, they are the first ones to come up uh, to NRDGS work. So now all these cliche prejudices should, prejudices should be should not be believed. And even if even if, those, even if those prejudices turn out to be true, we need to ensure that these are broken and there is a change in behavior. We need to work on behavioral changes in these areas. And another important thing is that these are anyway small districts uh, uh, where there's a small population. So we, we need to like really focus on targeting names and not targeting numbers. Uh, you know, that is what uh, will work in these areas. Um, yeah. And uh, from random erratic monitoring to regular systematic monitoring in these places. What happens most of the times, the monitoring is always on the roads. So we need to move from that system of monitoring institutions on the roads to actually clearly target institutions that deserve monitoring and, and monitor them. And uh, most of the times in these areas, we need to focus on irrigation and drinking water. I put a lot of stats for you to understand. Uh, you know, most of the districts, not only in Chhattisgarh, but across India under national influence, you will find that the irrigation coverage is very, very less. And uh, the yield from the um, uh, from the fields is also normally very, very less. Uh, you know, so and so we need to really focus on irrigation and drinking water in these places. And women and women and men need to be coded into slowly pushed into SAGs and federations. Uh, into cities and federations on uh, for forest produce or for any other crop that we get in the local areas. And uh, rehabilitation of natural violence affected people should be a very, very important step. Unless and until uh, you show that you care, you know, why would people come to trust you? So anybody who's affected by natural violence will have to be taken as a top priority. The, the families to, to get them jobs, uh, to get them a house, to get them to get the children, like, children put in a school, Everything of the particular family will have to be taken care for you to, you know, win their trust. And uh, normalization is a, as a, is a big trust activity. Many times the Maxwell movement has disrupted normal functioning of PDA shops, transport facilities, uh, tribal markets, and so on and so forth. So everywhere the whole trust should be normalization. Uh, you know, and uh, uh, where, we, where we tell people, look, we will not normalize it in, in a fashion as it was happening 10 years back. How do we do that? You know, what happens when you do this? You appeal to their their sense of uh, um, um, uh, belonging and their sense of pride when they have seen these institutions function with a lot of, uh, uh, you know, a lot of vibrance, like a, a functional, vibrant art bazaar. Uh, the moment they remember it, they, they would be so happy around uh, a functional art bazaar, you know. So you can actually rekindle their old memories of glory, of pride, when you when you actually start a hard bazaar again. So these are these are important to to basically let them understand that you know we care for their own uh, uh, you know past glorious days where they lived life in their own uh, fashion uh, to 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 be re-established and we care for them basically. And again, many times you can't reach out directly. You have to use a lot of middlemen. I mean, good NGOs to reach out to people and. Uh, Tourism, particularly religious tourism, can be a big antidote to uh, the strategy of seclusion by Naxals. Many times what happens, the Naxals are unable to actually stop the, um, um, uh, you know, religious outreach. Like, uh, if there are temple madais, uh, melas, religious festivals, they have been stopped. The whole focus should be to revive these things. For example, the Danteshwari temple in Dantevada, the moment it was kickstarted back and put in action, a lot of people started coming in and Naxals could not stop that. You know, they can't stop a, a stop a tribal jatra. They can't stop people from coming to a temple, basically. So I think particularly religious tourism you know, plays a big role uh, in these places, in normalization. As I already told, you should not only be uh, be just, but also be seen just in these areas. And you need to take special efforts to show that, basically. 
and uh, as sports as a special tool for connecting a lot of examples in the country we have known football collectors who used to travel to football to areas give it to kids you know so sports is a great tool for connecting and then to bring people together and to utilize their free time something and uh, pesa and capacity building of panchayats is a very very important element um, uh, because decentralization is a, is a big key uh, what happens is the moment you activate panchayats uh, the 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 institution which the naxals have set in uh, called the janatana sarkars they lose relevance you know the moment you empower people the way they have empowered people becomes irrelevant because when you empower people you empower panchayats you go with a lot of funds uh, and you know you uh, so so that 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 actually kills the naxal grassroots level institutions so who would value a janatana sarkar with just a group force of violence backed uh, backing it uh, or uh, i mean a panchayat a functional panchayat a lot of funds in its kitty which can design its energies works which can implement a lot of schemes in its place you know the, the the normal choice would be to go to a functional panchayat and the next thing is you will not find enough human resources so anybody can handle any post as per their capability is a strategy we need to like really look out for people who are creative who are capable and who are committed to work in these areas and pick anybody to give any task and get the work done not just wait for the particular officer uh, vacancy to be filled and uh, the biggest dues are nrgs agriculture and allied activities as the core thrust because the moment you start employing people and there is money in people's pockets uh, i always call this scheme nrgs as naxal kila you know uh, this scheme alone is capable of actually weaning away people from uh, um, from the from the hold of uh, naxals actually then of course capacity building of our human resources and local youth who are qualified semi qualified and non qualified Uh, into into whatever possible uh, channels is very very important and uh, uh, coordination with political representatives police and paramilitary and departments multiple departments is a huge activity there because even a small work of laying a pmjsw road cannot happen in a routine fashion you know you need to work for security uh, you need to work on political representatives who will offer security in those places uh, you know every small job requires a lot of coordination in these places and at the policy level governments should think of of a good personal policy if somebody knows that in his whole career of let me say 30 to 35 years he will have to spend few years in the entry level and after the promotions uh, you know if somebody is let me say selected for three promotions at every promotion level he will have to he will have to spend at least two to three years in an axel area if you can actually categorize the districts into category a b and c c being the tough districts natural districts once once people know that they're not going to stuck get stuck in these places permanently the motivation is different you know i know people who have been stuck in these for 12 years 13 years to 25 years and what not so there's no motivation at all so the personal policy where you actually rotate your personnel and people when they know that they will be moved out uh, uh, you know it 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 it, it actually helps a uh, uh, health administration function efficiently in, uh, in these in these areas and i mean as i told about fixed tenure and the fixed transfer periods may help and then classification of districts and compulsory serving in each class of district and then serving in difficult areas should become compulsory for the promotion activities what happens is in the system 10 percentage of people normally have that jugaad the ability to uh, get uh, um, get networks through politicians or to senior bureaucracy and you know get a get a get, get a choice posting whereas the rest 90 percentage actually suffer So if you actually put up a fair system in place where everybody will have to go through the grind people will not be objecting they will not be looking at uh, looking at you know jugards uh, or paying money to get uh, choice postings you know they, uh, they they would still serve with a lot of commitment and then filling vacancies has to be top priority in these districts then uh, there is a lot of special pay packages and incentives for doctors uh, teachers administrators who work in these areas it is available now and um, and you need to really have an innovative ideas for for creating a pool of local human resources who can work for you in a lot of projects uh, like it can be a pool of panchayat secretaries it can be a pool of icds uh, sector supervisors it can be any d uh, and it, the the whole ad hocism should go so it's think for today and think more for tomorrow you know you might you will have to do firefighting yes but at the same time when you firefight also keep in mind that you need to have a long term strategy for 5 years 10 years uh, in mind and uh, i think we should think of also a special construction battalion on the lines of bro water roads organization to take up infrastructure work in these areas because infrastructure creation is a huge challenge in these areas and securing 
um, uh, 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 contractors uh, uh, and their machinery in these areas is a big challenge. So if we can actually have a special construction battalion, it will be great for these places. And uh, um, this, is a, this is a very controversial kind of opinion. Uh, recognizing the STs as STs across the country, you know, this is my personal stance. A uh, Gond, because we had made these state borders, a uh, Gond and Chhattisgarh has relatives across the border in uh, Andhra Pradesh. And when he moves there and settles there, he will have to consider as a tribal. And then he becomes a general category. Some of the tribal tribals generally don't have this notion of uh, notion of your states. You know, we have put in these states in place. So can you really think of a model wherein the the, 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 the tribals are treated as tribals across borders? And the state governments open up open up their uh, institutions uh, for employment and for education uh, to them. You know, because they they if they say they move inside. They are moving in Dandakaranya. They are not moving inside Andhra Pradesh and Odisha or elsewhere. It has been their traditional homeland, and that is how their movement has been all along. We have put in the state borders as restrictions and not started treating them differently when we when they move across the borders. Yeah. And this nationalism is a political movement and has to be met politically. It can't really be met administratively or uh, you know militarily. Uh, a political movement will have to be challenged politically. So we need to really create this political capital from among the masses to fight this movement in a peaceful way. Uh, you know, and uh, also we need to revisit ceiling laws for redistribution of land and uh, uh, the laws prohibiting transfer of Adivasi lands to non-Adivasi lands. Uh, these laws are in place. Uh, they have to be very, very strongly implemented uh, because this is one key area of distress for people. And a revival of these local cooperatives like, you know, uh, the LAMs, the PACs, the JFMCs, uh, grain banks, uh, and all of things. And the minor forest producer, only recently, after all our pestering and after all our, uh, you know, uh, continuous uh, insistence, uh, now we have around 39 to 40 products under the, of MSPs under the MSP list, under the scheme called Vandan Yojana. So this has been a long-standing demand and this has to be met because... 40 is even a less number. We need, we need more products to be added, minor products to be added to the list. And this. And we need modern storage facilities for the rural hearts. And we need marketing support for them. And special schemes for special needs. You know, we need to like, relax population norms, distance area teacher norms. Like we can't still stick to the 3,000 population for every um, sub health center norm in a tribal area. We have to relax it as it suits the local conditions. And I think residential schools on a big scale. Is a huge answer uh, to them, you know. So we had uh, replicated it everywhere in uh, in the next areas in Chhattisgarh. We had put an educational city in one in Dantewada. I had put in a hundred acre educational hub in Sukma with a capacity for five thousand children to study in one place. With the Kendra Vidyalaya, the Jawaharlal Nehru Vidyalaya, and uh, uh, Sarosh Abhiyan uh, model ashram, everything in one place, shared facilities. So, you know, you create huge educational hubs where people actually, you know, stay comfortably. Uh, and there's a huge, uh, you know, uh, learning from each other uh, situation from from KVs and JNVs uh, to our own local schools. Midday meal is a very, very crucial factor. We need to strengthen midday meal. And I also always say this, don't scatter and put it in a platter. When you have to spend something for public, uh, for, public uh, for a panchayat, <laughs> let's not just, you know, give one scheme uh, and not give the other and give the other, give the other scheme, a follow-up scheme on the third year. If you're going to dig a board well, you should also provide the motor and also pro provide the electricity connection to the motor all in the same sequence. It is not that you'll give two borewells here today and then they will have to wait and petition you again for a motor and again wait, wait and petition you again for electricity connection. So put it in a platter, you know. You have to you have to finish it like an end to end. Uh, the, the whole operation of end to end has to be complete. If you're going to give them give somebody a land development uh, a scheme, also ensure that you give them seeds, ensure that, ensure that you give them fertilizers. Ensure that you give them, um, uh, you know, a tractor. So things should all go as a package uh, in a platter and not uh, scatter, basically. And uh, in the next areas, we need to create our own system of rewards and, uh, 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 you know, sports facilities. And uh, we need to motivate our own staff. So keeping an officer's club's work, farewells, welcome events, uh, get togethers, all of them keeps the people motivated and engaged in these places. Uh, and... Uh, I think I am done. Yeah.